Here's a question from Renee who wants to know if people can see demons, and there's an example of someone in their life who's seen uh, shadow people, silhouettes and so forth, also noting it might have something to do with alcohol. But thank you for taking the question. Thank you, Renee, for asking it. It's a tricky one because people can claim to have lots of experiences, and as one prone to hallucinations myself, I can usually tell when something isn't actually there, when it's coming from my subconscious as opposed to a spiritual entity. I wouldn't say 90, yeah, 98% of the time that I'm seeing anything that's actually there, entities and spiritual. The other times I have to base it on the body language of others. It would be noting a coping skill. But regarding scripture in this regard, experiences aside, notice how I did that. Um, there's three places that would give us reason to doubt demons taking on a visual appearance, and two reasons that would give us an idea. There are instances where that can happen, but through a uh, median, so to speak. The ways we would say it's unlikely is first in the book of Job, chapter 4, where Eliphaz, uh, granted he was in the wrong when he was making these statements, but he still makes true statements throughout of it. Uh, he describes something that a lot of you guys, if you ever watch Ghost Hunters or something, may find familiar. <laughs> this is verse 12. Now word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it. I was disquieted in disquieted thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falls on men. Fear came upon me in trembling, which made all my bones sp uh, shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair on my body stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice saying, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? And he goes on to emphasize the point further. But here's the idea being said here. This is in the context of poetry, so take it as with a grain of salt as whether Eliphaz is speaking from an experience because of limited scripture, whether this is a poetic observation, not an actual uh, instance of the event in the life of Job, or if this is uh, actually an encounter. We need to clarify, though, what makes the difference between a demon and an angel is the message, and this is a true one. So whatever uh, Eliphaz saw or didn't see, actually, it was sensational, but it wasn't visual. He could hear things. It interacted with him in a physical way, but limited to what the messenger, what the angel, that's what that means, uh, had to say to him. And it was, can a mortal be more righteous than his maker? Goodness is based on God's nature, not you thinking you're better than people. That would be the first instance of this spiritual encounter. The second is, again, another instance of an angel appearing to somebody, but in a physical form as they deemed fit. And this is in the book of Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. Renee, you can read it on your own time, but the angel Gabriel, and also in Luke chapter 1, is described in appearance as a man, not, you know, with wings or uh, unstylish robe or anything like that. He just looked like a normal guy. But Daniel rightly concluded it was Gabriel because he's like, haven't we met before? He's like, yeah, I'm the guy who gave you the other vision. It's like, oh, what, what, what now? <laughs> so, paraphrase, of course, but you get the point. <laughs> uh, continuing on, though, the third one is where we get that idea of, and this is moving from angels to the demonic, the gathering demoniacs. We can talk about the guys in Acts who beat up the uh, guys who were trying to perform exorcisms apart from relationship with God, and I'll be honest, I find the situation funny. Maybe you don't, but... <laughs> I'm a guy. So the point you yeah. made is this. Uh, the demons did not interact with this world in a physical way. They had no visual appearance or any stature on their own, but they could interact through a medium, and that was a human body that had willingly interact or welcomed that sort of spiritual influence onto themselves. We can also note the uh, Phoenician woman whose daughter was demon-possessed, and how that happened, I don't want to know. But the point being made is this. We're given situations where the demons in of themselves didn't manifest in physical form, but were given physical forms based on the poor spiritual decisions of someone else. And this is what brings us to the final point, is when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, Satan spoke to him. Now, whether there was a visual 
accompaniment to Satan's form, or it was just these whispers, just these encounters and movements and changes of scenery. We aren't told in the text. All we're told is the source of the voice and the voice as a audience uh, in our Lord, and of course his responses to it. We aren't told what Satan looks like in those passages. We know he's an angel of light, a very beautiful one and a very wise one, but ultimately a very corrupt and uh, not nice one. But the point being made is just that. If we're going to go off of what we have in Scripture, that's the point. Demons are spiritual entities. They can't take on a physical form, or do anything for that matter, apart from the permission of God. And as we see, there are examples of judgments of God. See, uh, for example, Second Thessalonians 2 and Romans chapter 1. Read these on your own time, and if you need me to type these out for you, let me know, Renee. But uh, God handing people over to lies. If they don't want the truth, then he'll allow these entities to manifest in these ways. And of course, we have an example of that in the Old Testament as well. But the court of Ahaz, if you want to look it up, Ahab, excuse me. But the point being made is that demons are spiritual entities, thus they're not physical. They don't have a visual appearance. They can interact with the physical, which we have many in examples of in Scripture, but whether they're a good messenger, angel, or a false messenger, an adversary, a demon, that's what that means, it's all centering around what message accompanies them, not necessarily what they look like. And most demons are quite content by just being distractions more than anything else. And again, we're just speaking from experience, but can inform that from Scripture. If your friend's having an issue with the demonic, I'd say take advantage of the opportunity and say, well, if you want to deal with these things carte blanche, go to the one they're terrified of, because what does James say? The demons not only know there is one God, but that they aren't him. They tremble at the name of Jesus, and you can probably use this time of vulnerability spiritually to bring them back to a place of security in their relationship with God. That would be our advice as a follow-through, but note the point of the demonic. We can only go off of what we know. Um, Anything more to add or clarify? Yeah, there's one other instance in the Bible that may or may not be visible. We're not really sure because it hasn't happened yet. Uh, Revelation 9, John has shown some very creepy (laughs) demonic entities, to put it mildly. Now, are these perceivable by the people being afflicted by them in Revelation 9? We don't know. We have no idea, right? John's able to perceive them because he is in a vision at that point, and he's given special eyes to see these things. But will the people be able to? We have, we have no idea if that's going to happen or not. They'll feel the after effects, that's for sure. Yeah. But whether they'll see the cause of it, that's almost scarier. Yeah, absolutely. And so when someone is in a state of inebriation, whether it's from alcohol or drugs or something like that, your mind is not working very properly. And all of us, even in a sober state of mind, have seen things that weren't there. So you add to it drugs or alcohol, and you are very likable, uh, likely to see things that aren't there. So uh, it could be just a manifestation of your fears, your anxieties brought to the surface when you're in that inebriated state of mind, or it could be an actual presence of a demonic Entity. I have spoken to a couple people in my life where I really do believe that they saw or were able to perceive something in the spiritual realm resembling a demon, right? One would be my sister who uh, had a big issue with drugs and alcohol, and when she sobered up, it was a night where she was high, and she was laying on her bed, and she felt a hand pressing down on her, and she saw a form, and she cried out to Jesus and immediately left, and she felt like she was sober at that point. Never do drugs again. So you have an instance where she probably did have an encounter with an actual God allowed for a demonic entity to be perceived by her to scare her straight. Let's put it that way. And And that's uh, the key, because if it's, you know, oh, people can, you know, lean on something wrong, cut off blood circulation and put them in a state of paralysis and REM sleep, that's oftentimes where these night terrors or shadow people are mostly coming from. There's other instances where people, you know, are just on shrooms or whatever, and they're just seeing a conglomeration of everything they should or shouldn't have been watching in the movies the last three weeks. But the point of emphasis that would make you rightly discern, no, that was something real, is their reaction to the name of Jesus. And this is the fine line. Uh, For those of you who want to be exorcists out here, here's Exorcism 101. Here's your (laughs) demonology class for the week. The fine line between a mental disorder and demonic possession is that one name. Two syllables, <laughs> five letters, J-E-S-U-S. 
Jesus. If they don't react to that, then you're dealing with something chemical. If, speaking from experience, again, it, they look like they just got hit in the head with a brick, you're onto something. That's because that's the only name in which we have any power over that. Yeah. And uh, two other examples that me and Sean like to talk about are the encounters of Muhammad in the cave, as well as Joseph Smith in the forest. Now, interestingly, Muhammad, if you ever read his accounts that are contained in the Hadith literature of his encounter with... Yeah, the Sunnah more specifically. Right. His encounter with, quote unquote, Jibril, the angel. uh, It seems very demonic, right? Uh, But you don't really get the idea that he saw something. He definitely experienced some sort of an entity that squeezed the living daylights out of him and freaked him out. It made him suicidal. Seems very much like an encounter with a demon. And when you look at the track record of his life after that moment, seems like (laughs) some demonic influence there. Uh, Beyond that, Muhammad was involved in some pretty unsavory practices and had some very weird beliefs. Joseph Smith is another good example. He changed his vision over the years uh, so by the time you get to the end of his accounts of his first vision, that's what you're going to find in the Book of Mormon today at the Doctrine back of the covenants. Yeah, he, he says that he actually saw the father and the son, and they're the ones that talk to him. Now that his recounting of the first vision changes over the years. The first one he ever gave and recorded, he actually didn't see anything. He, he saw, just felt a great darkness that made him fear for his life. He thought he was going to get killed by something, and then all of a sudden, everything turned to light, and he's like. Oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> so when you read his first account, it's creepy. Uh, it definitely mirrors Muhammad's encounter with the entity in the cave. And I would definitely say that I believe these two men did encounter a demonic presence. Now, again, they didn't. it doesn't seem like they saw anything, but they did experience something, and it did change them, but not for the better. So.